Today, the Feast of All Saints. Remember, we're not honoring only the canonized saints, but those who no one knows about, perhaps members of our own families, our own relations who are in heaven. We honor these saints today, and it is this feast is the perfect opportunity to reflect on the joys and the happiness of the saints in heaven. And as we contemplate these saints, we ought to ask ourselves, however, what went on in their minds to make them saints? What were the thoughts that filled their minds and penetrated their hearts? What was it exactly that motivated them to become such saints, to attain such glory in heaven, that made them worthy to contemplate the beauty of the beatific vision for all eternity. After all, the saints were men, just like we are. They were children of Adam, born in original sin, subject their whole life long to the effects of original sin, subject even the holiest of the saints, subject to experiencing temptations. So many of them had temptations to pride, temptations of the flesh, and what not, even as they were in the heights of holiness. And they lived ordinary lives just as we do. Some of them were bankers. Some of them were bus drivers, for perhaps. Some of them were barbers, different things like that, just like we have our ordinary lives as well. But they did everything in an extraordinary manner, a holy manner. They lived according to the principles of the faith. And that's the key. We don't live as it, our present day and age teaches us to do. We don't live according to the moment. We don't live according to feelings. Moods change. Emotions come and go. But principles are always the same. And the saints were very principled people. So what is it, what principles filled their mind and motivated them to become such saints? I'll go through a little list here and just give you some of them and explain them briefly. The first principle is to remind themselves, I serve God. They realized that they served a God of infinite perfection, who was worthy of not just some homage, but who was worthy of infinite homage, infinite adoration. That is what God is worthy of. And not even the Blessed Virgin herself, as perfect as she was and sinless, not even she could give God infinite homage. The only one that could is our Lord Jesus Christ, being God, he could render infinite homage. But this thought that we can never give God enough should never discourage us, not once. It should rather make us realize that even if we had the love and the devotion of Our Lady and the saints, we would still have to say before God, I'm an un unprofitable servant. And this thought should lead us to greater humility. It should, as I said, rather than discouraging us, should spur us on to do more good, to serve God more holily, and to do everything with greater charity, so that we go from one good work to another our whole life long, knowing that we can never give God infinite homage, but at least we will give him everything that we possibly can. I serve God. Secondly, they always remember, God sees me. No matter where we are, no matter what we are doing, God sees us. Each one of us, in an intimate way, he sees us as we are sitting here in these pews. God said to Abraham, in the Old Testament, 
walk before me and be perfect. In other words, keep in mind that you are in my presence. Try this. Try this for one day. I'd like to see all of you try it your whole life long, but at least give it a shot for one day, the entire day now. Try to walk in the presence of God. Remind yourselves 10, 20 times during the day, at the beginning and the end of your work or prayer, that God sees me. If you do this, you will notice that the inspirations of the Holy Ghost, without which we can never become holy, you will notice that his inspirations will be multiplied and he will urge you more and more to lead a holy life. You will be inspired to make good resolutions and then will receive the graces to keep them. And the reason why we miss out on so many good opportunities in the practice of virtue is that we forget that God sees us. If St. Teresa of Avila, I believe it was, said, if a person were to live in the presence of God for a full year, that that soul would attain pretty much every virtue if we could persevere for that one year. Thirdly, all that I do, I do for God. We should, looking at it from a more negative angle, we should never do anything that we cannot offer to Almighty God but rather all that we do should be for him. If we were given the task of working for some famous person, you choose him. Your favorite athlete, your favorite singer, a king, a president, whatever it might be, whoever it might be, if you were given the task to work for your favorite famous person, you would take great pride in the work that you do and you would be most careful to do everything as well as possible. But in the service of God, you are serving one who is infinitely more dignified than your favorite person. I don't remember if it was a story of St. Bernadette of Lourdes or St. Therese of Lisieux, who once saw a nun sweeping in the sick room. And she noticed that in the corners and under the bed there was still some dust. And then she got off, got after the, the nun and said, well, God sees under the beds too and in the corner. God sees it all. Do it well. All that I do, I do for God. Therefore, I must do it well. Fourthly, and this is one to frequently bring to mind, either I will one day go to heaven, or I will go to hell. It is one of those two places, and it is a fact, a truth, that we cannot avoid, whether we want to believe that or not. It is a fact that no one can escape. Either we must live in the grace of God and go to heaven, or we will fall into sin and be condemned to hell, with the demons and lost souls. And we must then live holy now. How often we get up in the morning and we have all these good resolutions. And then throughout the day we, we say, well, maybe I'll do this tomorrow. I'll put off my spiritual reading till tomorrow, my rosary till later, and all of the rest. Now is the time for salvation. St. Bernard of Clairvaux once said that not to go forward in the way of perfection, is to go backwards. If I do not become entirely holy, though I should die in the state of grace, the fires of purgatory must cleanse me until I am perfectly holy. That is a, a thought as well. So often we're not, we don't tend to perfection. We just want to be basically good Catholics. But no, God calls us to be perfect. Even in this life, all of us should be perfect in virtue. And the proof that he calls us to perfection is that if we're, we do not die in the state of perfection, then we must go to purgatory 
to be purified. Only the perfect can enter the kingdom of heaven. And it is better to labor and suffer meritoriously here on earth than it is to endure the sufferings of purgatory without any merit. Fifthly, if I do not reach the degree of holiness that God wants for me, I may be entirely lost. A perfect example would be Judas. He was called to be an apostle. He was called to share the glory in heaven with the other apostles. He didn't reach that degree of perfection that God had chosen for him, and he committed suicide and lost his soul. Our holiness, our salvation, may depend upon our, our correspondence with a single grace. It's like a chain. The way that God sets it up, he gives us a chain of graces all our life long. He gives us the first one that we accept. Then he gives us a second one, and we accept it. And so on and so forth. But then there may come that day when you don't accept the grace or cooperate with it. You lose the link, and your chain just falls apart. And your soul might indeed be lost. Or at least it would not reach the degree of perfection that God had in mind for it. Had the saints not listened to grace, they would never have become great saints. There's a story of St. Anthony, who was inspired to go to Mass one day. He just had the thought, maybe I should go to Mass today. He went. Had he not gone, however, he would not have received the next chain link of grace, you might say. He would not have received the other graces which came after. For in the course of that Mass, the gospel was sung, and he heard the words, If thou wilt be perfect, sell what thou hast, give it to the poor, and follow me. Now think, that is what made St. Anthony to leave everything behind <coughs> and to become a religious. And that is when he truly became a saint. Had he not cooperated with that grace to get up in the morning and go to Mass, he never would have heard the gospel saying, and he would still be in the world with all of his material wealth, and perhaps have lost his soul. This led him down the path of great sanctity. Sixthly, life is only one. We only have one life in which to attain our salvation. We only get one shot, and we must make it. It is now or never. But at the same time that we reflect on that truth, that we only get one shot, see the mercy of God in that he gave the angels only one opportunity <coughs> to prove themselves. If they were able to bow before the, hum the human nature of the Messiah, then they would be saved. If through pride they could not bend the knee before human, the human nature of God, then they would be condemned. Only one shot. But you and I, we get a whole long life, most of us anyway, a whole long life with chance after chance, fall after fall, and God keeps giving us graces. But then there's that last moment of life, when that comes, that's your final moment, moment and it, you must be in the state of grace. This is a very salutary thought. Time, too, time is so precious that it has been said that time is worth what God is worth. In this sense, that we gain or we lose God based on how we use our time. If we use it badly in sin, well, we lose God. Time is worth what God is worth. Seventhly and finally, we ought to think daily of the last hour. The people in the world would think this is a very morbid thought to meditate upon death. But indeed, in fact, it can be a little bit sad, can be a little bit depressing, but it is not morbid. It is something very healthy. 
Because when the time comes, if you've meditated often on your death, when the moment of death comes, you're used to it. You're ready. You're prepared. And the more you think about your death, the more you realize one day it will come that I must live today as if it were my last. I must do all of my actions in the same way in which I would have wished to have done them were I on my deathbed looking back. That is how we should be. These were the thoughts that filled the minds of the saints, that motivated them to do more than ordinary piety, but to, to be heroic in virtue. And so on this great feast of all saints, let us pray to them. Pray that we too may keep these motives, these maxims in mind, and that we may receive an efficacious grace that always pushes us forward to become more and more heroic, so that one day we too may join all of our brothers and sisters, saints in heaven. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost.